In chapter 16, the goal is going to be to get to three-dimensional space and to talk about circulation and flux uh, in three-dimensional space over a closed region. To be able to talk about those two concepts, uh, which is actually the goal of this whole chapter, we first have to go back to our vector calculus and we'll talk about vector fields. We'll talk about functions being represented in both vector form and as real valued functions and so on. Let's go ahead and recall our vector fields. A vector field is simply a way to describe how force flows. So some force that we can describe with a vector field would be wind or just current in general. It could be wind current, could be water current, but anything that flows and has a magnitude. Magnetic fields, that's often described with vector fields. When we do sketch a vector field, sometimes it helps to draw what we call streamline or flow curves to describe the vector field. In this box is the definition of a vector field of two dimension. So let's just say that we have these two real valued functions f and g. Then a vector field f can be described as the vectors f comma g. So that's how we write it in vector notation, or we could write the vector field in ij notation where i and j are the unit vectors. A vector field, in shorthand, we'll just write f comma g, is continuous or differentiable if f and g are continuous and differentiable. And it makes sense to talk about whether a vector field is continuous or differentiable because vector fields are functions. The first thing we're going to do is practice sketching a vector field. Example one. We want to sketch the vector field, and this is a very simple vector field. It's x comma 0, which means our y component is always going to be 0. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and draw a coordinate system. So this would be my x and my y. When we draw a vector field, what we do is we pick a point some x, y, and then we'll get a vector that goes with it. In this case, our vectors are going to be x, comma, the y value is always 0. So it's always going to look like that. I'm just going to pick some common points, the origin. So I'm at the origin. What is the vector that corresponds to that? Well, the x component is 0, the y component is 0, so it's just the 0, 0 ve vector. That would just be the point of the origin. So let's try 1, 0. That would correspond to the vector 1, comma 0. But we're not starting at the origin. That point 1, 0 is our starting point. From the point 1, 0, we're going to go in the x direction 1 and the y direction 0 and draw our vector. Okay. So let's try another one. Uh, what about 2, 0? That gives me the vector 2, comma 0. So that means when I'm at the point 2, 0, I'm going to go 2 in the x direction, 0 in the y direction. Okay. So these vectors that we're drawing do not start at the origin. They start at the point that we're choosing. So for example, if I chose the point 1, 1, the vector that corresponds to that would be 1, 0. So at this point 1, 1, I'm going to go 1 in the x direction, 0 in the y. And we can keep doing this. We can keep looking at points. How about 1, negative 1? So I'm going to go to the point x is 1, 
y is negative 1. Well, that corresponds to the vector 1, 0. So 1 in the x direction, 0 in the y direction. Well, you'll see that this vector field is set up so that as you move away from the y-axis, the magnitude of the vectors gets larger. When you're close to the y-axis, in fact, let's just look at a point here. Say this is the point x is 0, y is negative 1. That corresponds to 0, 0. So if you're on the y-axis, anywhere on the y-axis, it's the zero vector. As soon as you move away from the y-axis, even a little bit, then you have a horizontal vector. Now what happens if you're looking at negative x values? Let's say that we want to look at the point negative 1, 0. Oops. Sorry. Well, at negative 1, 0, you're at the vector negative 1, 0. So that means from this point, you're going to go negative 1 in the x direction, 0 in the y. Vectors to the right of the y-axis are all moving towards the right, and they're getting larger in magnitude. Vectors to the left of the y-axis moving towards the left getting larger in magnitude. So if I were to just draw a few streamlines, it would look like this. Vectors getting larger and larger, and we would show the direction, right? So that's fine. And these would be our streamlines. Let's sketch another vector field. This vector field is simple. It's just negative x, negative y. Again, I'm going to go ahead and sketch my coordinate axis. Maybe I'll test a few points as I did before. 0, 0 is always nice. So I'm at the point 0, 0. What vector corresponds with that? In this case, it's the zero vector, so I'm not moving anywhere. Let's try one zero. And I could just look at this and say, oh, wow, no matter what x and y I put in, I'm just taking their negative. So it's going to flip and go in the opposite direction. Uh, so at the point one zero, I have the vector negative one zero, which means I'm going to move towards the origin. OK, well, what if I were to look at the point 0, 1? That would give me the vector 0, negative 1. So I move towards the origin. And it appears that the pattern is that we're flipping direction. So if I was were to take the point below 0, negative 1, it becomes 0, 1. So again, going towards the origin. And I'll find that all of these points give me towards the origin. What if I were to take 1, 1? So I'm here at 1, 1. It becomes a vector negative 1, negative 1. So that means negative x direction 1, negative y 1. And it's going towards the origin. And if you pick any point, it's going to move towards the origin. And the further away from the origin you go, the greater the magnitude of the vectors. For example, if I was at 3, 0, 1, 2, something here, then I would have the vector that corresponds to that would be negative 3, 0. So from here, I would go in negative 3. Pick any point anywhere and you're going towards the origin so this is enough for me to get an idea 
to see all these streamlines to get an idea of the shape of my vector field. These next two diagrams are some common vector fields that come up. The first one here, this is a rotation vector field. Clearly, it's a vector field that is rotating. And this particular rotation vector field has a form negative y x. This is not the only rotation vector field. There's infinitely many. Take any scalar and multiply it by this vector field, and you'll get a rotation vector field. Uh, if you just take positive y, negative x, you get a rotation vector field. It's just rotating in the opposite direction. This next one is a radial vector field. This comes up a lot. And when I talked about flux earlier, this is reminiscent of something uh, that is similar to flux. Okay, And that would be where you have this outward force from some region. So radial, radial vector fields have this really neat form here. In our example two, that was a radial vector field as well. That vector field actually went inward, but it was still a radial vector field. So whenever you have vector fields that go outward from the origin or come in towards the origin, that's what we call a radial vector field. So again, it points to or away from the origin at all points, except the origin itself. And then the rotation vector fields just rotate about the origin. So again, these radial vector fields come up so often that we have a definition and a specific form for them. So let's say that we have r, which is the vector x, y. Any vector field of this form, f of x, y times r, where f is a scalar valued function. So what is a scalar valued function? Look at our example two. So remember our example two? That was this vector field equal to negative x, negative y. Well, we could write that as negative one times x, y. So notice that this would be negative 1 times r. It's a radial vector field. f is a scalar valued function, and this is our f. It's equal to the scalar negative 1. So that's what I mean by a scalar valued function. Okay? So that's all radial vector fields will take that form, as our example 2 did as well. Some radial vector fields of specific interest are radial vector fields of this form, where you take r divided by its magnitude to the power of p. Okay? p is just some real number. So if you can write your radial vector field in this form, this is a very special, special vector field. So the vectors of this field are directed outward from the origin, and their magnitude is going to be 1 over the magnitude of r to the p minus 1. We'll move on to vector fields and radial vector fields in three-dimensional space. Uh, I would never expect you to sketch vector fields in three-dimensional space. They're a little bit difficult. So I'll just look at an example where it's already sketched using a program. So let's say that we have f, g, and h defined on some real three space. So a vector field, again, it's a function, and it's defined the same way that its components are the functions f, g, and h. So our vector field in vector form or in i, j, k form. Again, the vector field is continuous or differentiable as long as the f, the g, and the h are also continuous and differentiable. And again, of particular interest is our radial vector field below. 
This particular example, the vector field is x, y, e to the negative z. So one way you could sketch a three-dimensional vector space is to look at it in the xy plane, the yz plane, or the xz plane. So notice if I was to look at this from the side, uh, and it looks like this is the yz plane, a little bit offset, that's what our vector field would look like. And in fact, what's really interesting is notice that this kind of does look like an exponential function, right? So notice that my z component is e to the negative z. Now, if I was to look at this vector field from above, imagine getting rid of the z or just putting in zero for z. What's left over is the vector xy, which is a radial vector field. So the view from above, you get this radial vector field. Again, I don't expect you to graph vector fields in three-dimensional space, but it's nice to know that all you have to do is just look at it from different planes, right? X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z plane. Something that comes up quite a bit is gradient fields. So remember the gradient vector fields from Calculus 3? And all they were were the vectors of this form, partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y. And then we use this upside down triangle to indicate that it's a gradient vector field for our function with respect to variables x, y. Uh, something that does come up though, is level curves again if you have some surface z and you replace z with constants and you graph the following curve that you get in the xy plane that would be your level curves so level curves are just taking some surface and squishing it into the xy plane well, we're going to put this idea of level curves and gradient fields together. And we're going to look at a potential function. Potential function is just our function z. We're just giving it the name potential function. And we use phi to indicate it's a potential function. Uh, but what this is, is for every potential function z, you're going to have a correspondent gradient vector field F. The property is that on any of the level curves of the potential function, which is just some surface Z, any point, the gradient is going to be orthogonal to the level curve. Any point on any level curve, gradient orthogonal to that level curve. So that's the nice relationship between the gradient vector field and a potential function, which is what's in this box. So let's say that phi is going to be a, a blah, 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 differential, blah, 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 is a z function. <laughs> And we have level curves so that every point on our level curve, our gradient is orthogonal. And that's what you want to take away from all of that. Here's our definition in the box below of the gradient field and the potential function. So let's say that our surface Z is a potential function. But we can also talk about w as a potential function with x, y, z. So it doesn't have to be two independent variables. It could be three independent variables. And in fact, mathematically, we can have more than that. But usually, uh, two and three is where we would stop. Uh, so the vector field f, so this bold f, whenever we're talking about a potential function and you see the bold f, you can assume that it's the gradient field, which is just a partial derivative with respect to x, with respect to y. 
and if you have this w function with respect to z as well okay and it's going to go with a potential function so they go hand in hand so some vocabulary that might come up is level curves of a potential function they're called equipotential curves if you see this bold F, you can assume that it's the gradient, and you can assume it's everywhere orthogonal to every equi equipotential curve. If you're going to draw the gradient field and the equipotential curves or level curves, you could draw some streamlines. If you look at the diagram that follows, we have our level curve phi of xy. It's going to be the tangent inverse of y over x. So these green lines that are crossing through the origin, these are the level curves of phi. How did we get those? So remember, all we do when we draw level curves is we replace our function with a constant. So why don't I replace phi with 0? 0 equal to tangent inverse of y over x, that will be a level curve, which means tangent of 0 is equal to y over x. Tangent of 0 is just 0, so we get 0 is equal to y over x. Or in other words, y is equal to 0 y is equal to zero is simply the x-axis. So that would be one of our level curves. Uh, let's see, I'm dealing with tangent inverse. Let's do one more. So let's look at pi over six. I'm gonna replace my potential function phi, which is just some z value, with pi over six, equal to tangent inverse of y over x which means tangent of pi over 6 is equal to y over x. Tangent of pi over 6 is 1 over the square root of 3, I believe. I might be messing it up with square root of 3. So y is equal to 1 over the square root of 3 times x. So that would be a line through the origin with a slope of 1 over the square root of 3 and it would be this line here and notice that i could do a pi over three and so on and i get all these level curves of my potential function phi so i have my level curves now it's clear to see because these level curves are linear that my gradient vector field has to be orthogonal so i could pick any point the, the question I have is, how do I know that these gradient vectors are going in this particular direction? Why isn't it going in the opposite direction? Because to every point on any level curve, there's going to be two, at least two, right? I'm not considering magnitude. I'm going to have at least two vectors that are orthogonal. So how do I know which direction it is? Well, that's where we compute the gradient. So we need to find the gradient vector field. So remember, the gradient vector field is the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y. If I look at my potential function phi, which is tangent inverse of y over x, and I take the partial derivative first with respect to x, chain rule, derivative of tangent inverse is 1 over 1 plus the argument squared, which is y over x squared, times the derivative of the argument. Now, I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, so y is a constant, it becomes negative y over x squared. And then the next component would be the partial with respect to y, 1 over 1 plus the argument 
squared times the derivative of the argument with respect to the variable y, and that would be 1 over x. Uh, it's not necessary that I clean this up because I'm only computing the gradient just to verify which direction these orthogonal vectors are going to go in. But this is going to bug me, so I am going to clean this up and write this as negative y over x squared plus y squared and then x over x squared plus y squared. Double check me on all of that. Okay, so now let's go back to our diagram. Uh, let's just say I'm at this point on the x-axis. I'll just say that this is the point 1, 0. I'm at the point 1, 0. That means I'm going to put in 1 for x, y for 0 into my gradient function, and I get the vector 0, comma 1. So at the point 1, 0, I'm going no movement on the x, up 1 on the y. So that just verifies uh, the direction that the gradient vectors are going in. We'll do another example. Example three, we want to find the gradient field for this potential function, which is just x plus y. Here we're only concerned with our absolute value of x less than or equal to 2, absolute value of y less than or equal to 2. So when we do sketch a few of the level curves and the vectors of the gradient field, we're only going to go from negative 2 to positive 2 on the x and the y axis. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go 1, 2. Just because I don't want to go beyond this, I was given the criteria, right? The x and y are just between negative and positive 2. I'm going to draw a few level curves. Oops. So if I was going to draw a few level curves, all I have to do is take my potential function and set it equal to some constant. Uh, why not start with 0? So if phi is equal to 0, that means that I have x plus y equal to 0, right? So this is simply the, maybe it's easier to see if I solve it for y. y is equal to negative x. So this would just be a line through the origin going down. I'm going to use a different color for that. And I'm only concerned with going from to negative 2, so I'm staying within this box here. Uh, let's pick 1. So that means x plus y is equal to 1. For me, it's easier to sketch it if I write it in slope-intercept form. So slope of negative 1, uh, when x is 0, y is 1. So this is shifted up 1. and then comes down, right? Uh, maybe I could label this. This is 1. Here, this is by 0. What about negative 1? Then this would be x plus y equal to negative 1, which would be y equal to negative x minus 1, line going down, shifted down to negative 1. So this just said draw a few level curves. So I'm going to stop right there. Uh, that's enough. Now I need to draw my gradient vector field. The, the gradient vector field is going to be the partial derivative with respect to x, which if you're looking at x plus y, that's just 1, 
partial derivative with respect to y is 1. So I have the gradient field. And there are the vectors 1, 1. All that means is no matter what point I'm at on any of my level curves, I'm going to go a positive 1 in the x direction and a positive 1 in the y direction. Uh, so that means that my gradient vector field is going kind of upward, right? So at any point, it's going to go up. Okay. So that's the basic idea. So let's look at some properties of our gradient vector field. So again, this is going back to previous calculus class. Here we're assuming that the gradient field is not equal to zero. Remember when we talked about the maximum rate of increase? That would be in the direction of the gradient vector field. And the rate of increase would be its magnitude. So maximum rate of decrease would be the negative of the gradient field. And its rate of decrease would be the negative of the magnitude. So a line tangent to a level curve is going to be orthogonal to the gradient. And then going back to this diagram where we had our level curves and we had this gradient vector. So remember at any point, if you would draw a, oops, I don't want that. If you would draw a tangent vector, it would necessarily be orthogonal to the gradient, right? So the tangent vector at any point is going to be orthogonal to this gradient vector. Now our tangent vector, just as a reminder, this capital T, that stands for the unit tangent vector. So whenever you see the capital T, you can assume it's a unit tangent vector. And moreover, it goes in the direction that the curve is generated. So this is not clear on my level curve. I'm just drawing tangent vectors all over the place. But let's just say that this the curves were going counterclockwise. That means that the tangent vector would have to go in the direction that the curve is generated in, OK? The unit tangent vector. Some other things that we want to look at is if you see a little t, that is just any tangent vector. Magnitude does not matter. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's tangent in the direction the curve is generated or not. So it could be in the opposite direction of the unit tangent vector. It's just any vector tangent to the curve. What this means is that if you take any tangent vector at any point, it's going to be perpendicular or orthogonal to the gradient vector. So we use this upside down t to indicate that. If you're not familiar with that symbol, that means orthogonal. at any point. What does that mean? Going back to our dot products, remember these are two vectors. So if you dot two vectors that are orthogonal, their dot product is 0. Now something else that comes up is any vector tangent is going to be, remember these double lines, this means parallel to our derivative. Because remember, the derivative uh, is the slope of a tangent line. 
So that means the tangent vector is parallel to the derivative going back to calculus three, we could write that as the negative partial derivative with respect to x over partial derivative with respect to y. So these are just some ideas that come up between orthogonal and parallel and tangent vectors. What this means that is, is if you take any tangent vector, it's going to be parallel to, remember this is just derivative, in vector form it would be the potential function with respect to y, the derivative with respect to y, negative derivative with respect to x. So the any tangent vector should be parallel to a vector of this form, but where the negative goes doesn't matter. You could write this as negative partial with respect to y, positive partial with respect to x. Well, let's use these concepts in example four. In example four, we're given this vector field, x, y, and we have this curve, all points x and y, so that x squared plus y squared is equal to four. So the curve is just a circle of radius two. Now, how is this vector field affecting the curve? Well, one thing we could do is we could determine points uh, on our level curve where the vector field is either tangent or normal to our curve. I'm going to define a potential function phi equal to x squared plus y squared. And then I can then talk about the gradient of phi as being the vector field 2x, 2y. The reason why I'm doing that is now I have these two vector fields, f and gradient of phi, and I'm going to be talking about tangent and normal, so I can compare these two vector fields using the properties of tangent and normal. Notice that our curve C then becomes a level curve of phi when phi is equal to 4. I'm going to look at tangent first. So again, are there any vectors in our vector field that are tangent to our curve at some point on that curve? It looks like tangent. There's two ways that we can look at that. And when we talk about tangent, we could ask ourselves, okay, are there any vectors in our vector field that are parallel to tangent vectors of phi since our curve C is a level curve of phi? So the tangent vectors of phi would be negative partial derivative with respect to y, partial derivative with respect to x. That then becomes the vector field negative 2y, 2x. So that's one way to look at it. Or another way is to say, oh, okay, well, if any of the vectors in our vector field are tangent to the curve, then that means these vectors must be perpendicular to the gradient vector. So the other thing we could do is say, okay, are there any vectors in our vector field that are perpendicular or normal to the gradient of phi? And which you choose doesn't really matter. Oftentimes, one will be shorter than the other. We'll go ahead and do them both. And now, if I were to look at this first property, looking at parallel, uh, remember, vectors are parallel if they're scalar multiples of each other. So can I find some constant? I'll call it A so that when I multiply that by my vector field x, y, it's going to be equal to 
the tangent vectors negative 2y, 2x. Oops. So can I find that? Well, then it's just a matter of algebra. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the a and then set the two components of these vector fields equal to each other to get ax equal to negative 2y, ay equal to positive 2x. I have two equations but three variables. So there may not be a solution, but we'll go ahead and try and solve. And there's a bunch of different ways you could solve. You could use substitution. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take both equations and solve for the variable a. So first equation, I'm going to divide by x. Second equation, I'm going to divide by y. But I can only do that if x and y are not equal to 0. I'll get a equal to negative 2y over x a equal to 2x over y. And here, remember, I'm assuming that x is not equal to 0 and y is not equal to 0. Now, these two equations are both equal to a, so I can then set them equal to each other and solve for negative 2y over x equal oops, to 2x over y. I'm going to divide by 2 and multiply both sides by x over y to get negative 1 is equal to x squared over y squared. Notice there's no solution for that. Since the x squared is never negative, y squared is ne never negative, x squared over y squared can never be equal to negative 1. So no solution. So we think right now, OK, so there are no tangent vectors because there's no solution to that equation. However, I still need to check these values when x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. So that would actually give me the point 0, 0. But notice that we're trying to find the points on our curve where vectors of the vector field are tangent. So this point has to be on our level curve C. But the point 0, 0 is not on our curve. So using this property of parallel, I, I find no solution. There are no points on our curve where the vector field is tangent to the curve. But I could have also used the fact that vector field perpendicular to gradient. Right. So if vectors in our vector field are tangent to the curve, they necessarily have to be perpendicular to the gradient vectors. What does that mean? Well, that means if I take my vector field and I dot it with the gradient field, it should be equal to 0, because that's a property, right? Dot products are equal to 0 when vectors are perpendicular or normal to each other. That tells me that 2x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 0. Now I could divide both sides of this equation by 2 to get x squared plus y squared is equal to 0. Uh, but I could see that the only solution in this point, uh, in this case, is where x is 0 and y is 0. So it would be the point 0, 0 would be the only solution. But again, that's not on our curve C. So what this means is that there are no vectors tangent to our curve C. OK? Now let's check normal. So just because there are no vectors that are tangent to our curve does not mean that all vectors are normal. It could be that some vectors are normal or no vectors are normal. However, what if I had found that all vectors are tangent? If I had found that all the vectors were tangent, 
then I would not have to check normal because if all vectors are tangent, then no vectors are normal. However, I found that no vectors are tangent. So again, that doesn't mean that all vectors are normal. It could, but not necessarily. So we still have to check that. So what I want to do is use the fact that if any of the vectors in our vector field are normal to the level curve, that must mean that they are parallel to the gradient. So we should be able to find some constant, I'll call it A, so that when we multiply it, by our vector field x, y, we should be able to find some points x and y where these guys are equal. And as we did before, it's just algebra. But notice that I don't even have to write out the equation. I can just look at that and say, oh, well, a has to be 2. So this is actually true for a is equal to 2. But notice that it's not true for just some of the x, y. It's for all points x, y. So for a equal to 2, all points x and y are normal. Okay, so it just happens that all of the vectors of our vector field F are normal to all the points on C, or maybe all the points on C have vectors from the vector field F that are normal to C, however you want to say it. It's all points. <laughs> okay. We'll get a little theory in there. That's always nice, and we can use those theories about parallel and perpendicular in example five as well. Let's say we have this potential function x plus y squared. Part A, we want to find f, the vector field f. Now, since we're given a potential function, we can assume that f is a gradient vector field. Now, part A is fairly straightforward. f is going to be the gradient vector field. And in this case, it's a partial with respect to x, which would be 1, partial with respect to y, which is 2y. Done. Part b. Show that our gradient vector field is orthogonal to the equipotential curve at the point 1, 1. So what that's saying is compute Oops, sorry, 1, 1. Compute the vector of our gradient vector field at the point 1, 1. So all we're doing here is putting in 1 for x and 1 for y. So we get the vector 1, 2. What we need to show is that 1, 2 is and I'll use orthogonal to any tangent vector that I choose to pick at the point 1, 1 on the curve. I'm going to use that previous property that the derivative, remember the derivative is just the slope, which is the slope of a tangent line, which is a tangent vector. I'm going to use that it's the negative partial with respect to x over partial with respect to y. In our case, that would be a negative 1 over 2y. I'm evaluating this at the point 1, 1, and that would give me negative 1 half. So remember, that is a slope. A slope is a y over an x value. So if I write this as a y over x value, I can write this as, depends on where you want to put the negative, as negative 2 comma 1 or the vector 2 comma negative 1. It doesn't really matter which one I choose. That is a tangent vector, OK? At the point 1, 1.
So that means that, and it doesn't matter which one I choose, when I take the dot product with our vector one comma two, I better get zero. And that would be negative two plus two. So zero. Uh, so that's all I had to do to show that it's orthogonal. I'm done. Let's look at C. Because we're going to use that same property for C. So C is a little bit different because it says that it's not just at the point 1, 1. It's all points x and y. So we want to check to see that any tangent vector is going to be orthogonal to any vector of our vector field. So a general tangent vector will go back to what we did in part B when we had the negative 1 over 2y. So if it's negative 1 over 2y, remember that's a y over x, then a tangent vector can be written as the vector 2y comma negative 1. Now there's infinitely many tangent vectors, right? Or negative 2y positive 1. Or any scalar multiple of any one of those vectors would be tangent at any point x, y. All I have to do is take one of those, and I'll just choose the first one, 2y comma negative 1, and dot it with my gradient 1 comma 2y. So when I dot these, I get 2y minus 2y, which is equal to 0. So we've just shown c. We've shown that our vector field is orthogonal at all points x and y. So again, a lot of theory here. Let's go to D. We want to sketch two flow curves that are everywhere orthogonal to the equipotential curve. So here we have the picture of all level curves. And I'll just go ahead and draw them here. So drawing them straight onto the diagram. Let's think about this. I'm going to look at any point on the x-axis. So again, we're going back to part A. Our gradient vector field is 1 comma 2y. If you pick any point on the x-axis, the y value is 0. So the vector at any point on the x-axis is going to be the vector 1 comma 0, which means that we're doing this. Okay. So I'll just draw one nice smooth curve because uh, I'm getting lazy. Now think about any other point. I'm going to look at a point where the y value is positive, the x value is negative. But it doesn't matter what the next uh, what the x value is because remember in my vector field my gradient vector field the x value is always one. So if I pick any positive y value, I'm going to multiply it by two, so it's going to get larger, and the x value is one, which means I'm going to go into the positive one in the x direction, and then I'm going to double the y value, and it's normal. So imagine that I just keep doing that. I'll draw a few more. So normal at every point on the level curve. Uh, so that's flow curves. It's just a single curve that kind of flows and is or orthogonal to every point on the equipotential curve. So I got about three of them. I think that's fine. Okay, so that's it for this section. And um, that's it. <laughs>